Somebody say amen. God is good. And all the time. I love to sit with you sometimes, don't I? And just to, just to share a bit of studies with you. We've been on this theme the last little while. The whole month of March kind of set us off a little bit. On April, sorry, because we had Easter, Good Friday and Easter and, and um, our Palm Sunday as well. So we're going to re-engage, we're going to re-engage uh, with this whole idea of Christ is coming. Jesus is coming. And I want to just, but I have to give you a quick review, only because most of you would have forgotten by now, right? Most of you would have forgotten what we talked about the last little while. So open your Bibles or your cell phones or whatever you use for, for reading the Word of God because we're going to go through a bit of Bible study. But before we do, let me introduce with you what we did the last few weeks. I think it was way back in March, I want to say March the 10th. I think we started off right there. Um, and we have since then come to, to we did three, three lessons. All right. And the first one, we talked about the kingdom. The kingdom of God, remember that? The already and the not yet. And that kingdom of God, even though my theme is pending, right? The theme is pending to the end. Something is pending that will bring us to the end. We're going to talk about the pending. And we're going to go back and see where it started with the pending. But we talked about the kingdom of God in our context for the last uh, few weeks. And that, that introduction of, of that of kingdom story was that Jesus says, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So remember I says, the moment Jesus showed up, the kingdom showed up, right? And the good news is when Jesus left, the kingdom stayed with us. Because once Jesus came and made his appearance, the kingdom came for all of us on earth as it is in heaven. However, the final kingdom destination is still pending. And that's where we're going to go in a moment, right? So when we talk about Jesus' second coming, there is always a tension between that pending or the already and the not yet. That's where the pending comes in, right? So you'll see there, God raised up Christ Jesus and seated him in heavenly places in the realms where Christ is already seated with Christ. Remember my message when I talked to that Christ is sitting on the right hand of God? which means when we are sitting with him, we are probably sitting on the left hand of Jesus, right? So all we have to do when we call upon him is to do what? Look left. In the spirit realm, all you've got to do is look left and you have access to Jesus and the Father as well. And then we talked about the ascension because it was Acts chapters 1 verse 11 when he made his appearance and brought his kingdom with him. We just experienced the Good Friday and the Passover as well as the Easter story and the resurrection. He is risen. And because of that, he left that kingdom with the promised Holy Spirit, the Comforter, right? The Numa, yeah? And then he ascended. And in that ascension, we were told in the book of Acts, when the angels came and says, don't you worry, this Jesus who was left is going to come back again. In other words, he is pending. You got it so far, right? He is pending. He's gone to come back. And that was the ascension story that we read about. And then we jumped to the whole idea of the already and the not yet to explain what that means. It means the unknown and yet eminent. Or it means the unexpected but yet sure. When will Jesus come? We don't know. But boom, boy, will he ever show up. It's going to be a sudden, eminent surprise, even though we don't know yet when that should be. And Matthew chapters 4, Jesus spells it all out for us in the first part of Matthew of chapters 24 up to verse 35. Now, we have done verses 1 to 14, and we're going to do the second half, but I want to stick to one specific thing that Jesus said, and we're going to go back and see what Jesus told us to do. And then we, we did this. We talked about distractions and attractions. In that pending moment, we are distracted and we are attracted by so many things. That is wondering, leaving us wondering about this pending state. Is it real? Is it really going to happen? Mama's been telling me all about this. So was my grandparents. I keep hearing it. And nobody's saying what's going to really happen. Is it real, Lord? And we're all wondering in a war-torn world where evil is pervading us. 
where dictators seem to be in control, where there seems to be many antichrists running around. Lord Jesus, help me. Is this pending moment, is it real? So we have all these attractions and distractions which we had spoken about a few weeks ago. And sometimes the biggest distraction or attraction is the one in the middle. It's the one in the middle. By the way, it didn't start there. I suggested to you in my message a while back, it started when the world entered our private space. Now, we had radios for a long time. But when television showed up in our homes, it was the beginning of our demise. Television led us to technology. Technology has now led us to what we call a smartphone. And now the smartphone is outsmarting us because it controls our life. It controls our Christianity. It controls our spirituality. It controls everything we do. And this generation has no perspective going back to how old I am to understand what it means to not have a something outsmarting you. Because when I was growing up, I outsmarted everything. I used my brains. When I go to the ho- to, to, uh, to, to shop and I want change, I know 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now when you go to the store, they think 2 plus 2 equals 22. Because we can't think for ourselves anymore. Something else thinks for us. Something else empowers us. And it's not the Holy Spirit in most cases because we're relying on the distractions and the attractions. Anyways, let me move on. I made a promise I was going to wrap this up quickly today for the most part. And let's see if I can get there for, the, for all of you, right? And then Christ declares the signs of his return because all of this is really about deception. We have been deceived even in the 21st century. Remember Adam and Eve was deceived? Who deceived them? That serpent snake which was a mimic of the satanic attack. And he attacked Adam and Eve and deceived them to believe, right, that that fruit that God says don't touch, God didn't say really don't touch. He was afraid you would have power. No good and evil. He deceived them. And then Jesus shows up, the second Adam, in Matthew chapter 4. And what happens? It wasn't a snake, but it was the same Satan. And he showed, showed up and tried to do what? Deceive Jesus. But somebody say, thank God for the second Adam. Thank God for the blood of the Lamb, the Savior of the world. Amen. He told him, get thee behind me, Satan. It is written. It is written. It is written. Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus overcame every deception there is. And we can overcome too. So it's in this deceptive story, deception, wars, and rumors of wars. In Matthew 24, you'll see verse 4 is deception. Verse 2 is wars and rumors of wars. Verse, uh, se- verse 6, sorry. Verse 7 is nations against nations, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. All of these are in verse 7, you will see there. Hatred for believers in verse 9 to 12. And then false prophets. Woo! False prophets. False prophets. Watch out, he says. Make sure no one deceives you. Watch out. Make sure no one deceives you. Now, that's just introduction, but I want you to think of this word false prophet because now Jesus, Jesus is coming to the ends of the earth. Even though it's pending, he has come to the ends of the earth. While he's pending, he's relying on you now to be his feet, to be his spokesperson, to be his ambassadors, to replicate his power on earth, you, us, followers of Christ. Wherever we go, we have become the expression of Jesus in this pending moment. You are the Jesus to your friends, your family, your co-workers, and wherever you go. Did you get that? So it's the already and the not yet. You are already with Christ, and yet he's not with you in person. That means you represent him right now in that pending moment. Now, let me wrap it up quickly because we're going to have to continue on. But I have a slide to show you that I want to make sure you get this. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. We just read from verses 15 to verses 35. I want to read now from uh, the verse in Matthew 24. I want to read you verse 15. This is Jesus speaking on the Mount of Olives. 
right? And he's declaring to his disciples when they ask him, when shall these things be? And we've gone through this already with you. But verse 20, chapter 24, I want to show you something, and we're going to go to Daniel in a moment, right? right? Our oh, key verse is verse 14, as you see there, right? That this gospel of the kingdom will be what? Preached in all nations, all the world, right? To the ends of the earth. And guess what? And then the end will come. Then the end will come. That's verse 14. But I want to read you verse 15. Let's read verse 15. This is Jesus speaking 1,500 years later from the prophet Daniel. Jesus is speaking and quoting the Old Testament, specifically the prophet Daniel. Jesus is speaking to this so we can pay attention. And he says in verse 15, Chapter 24, verse 15. If you're online, hope you're following me. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation. Remember you read that in the gospel of Matthew? It was Jesus speaking. He wasn't saying something new. He was echoing what he already heard and know when he was with God when Daniel was there. And Daniel was captivated in Babylon when the kingdom was divided. The southern kingdom was captivated by King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Now, Daniel, being a very bright young man, as you know the story from Daniel's chapters 1 right through, you will know he was taken so that he can be culturalized to do what? To influence the people of Israel, to, to integrate into the society of the Babylonians. And that was King Nebuchadnezzar's plan until Daniel proved otherwise. Right? And what happened? He was praying like he wasn't, he wasn't supposed to pray. And he kept praying. And forgive him, pray. He was put in jail. He was put in a lion's den. Right? He was put in dungeons. And every time he was elevated because God was using him for a purpose to plan for us this vision that we're going to get to where our time will show up to what Daniel's prophetic vision means to us in 2022. Now, we're just only now starting because time is offhand. We're just starting. But if Jesus quotes Daniel... You got to stay with me for the next few weeks because I'm going to open your eyes to something you're going to be, you would not even believe. Because this abomination of desolation is serious stuff. You know who he's called? What he's called? Who does the abomination of desolation? Antichrist. Antichrist is the false prophet we just read. So we're going to get there short in a little while. Stay with me. But let's read, let's go to Daniel, because if Jesus quotes Daniel, what is Daniel saying really? That Jesus has to quote him. No, Jesus does quote Isaiah. He does quote Moses. But specifically when it comes to prophetic times, he quotes Daniel. And Daniel in chapters uh, 9, you will see there. So he quotes him here. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, you read this, let the reader understand. Which reader? People of Israel? You just read it. So you're supposed to understand. But you can't understand unless you go to Daniel. So you got to go to Daniel. Okay? And the prophet Daniel... Are you following me? Are you lost? I hope you're not lost. Daniel chapters 9. We can do a lot more on Daniel later on, but I want to be very specific. Daniel is praying. In fact, you know what? Go to Jeremiah 25. Go to Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Jeremiah 25, verse 11. I told you it's a Bible study. Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah is praying, Oh Lord, how long? You, you promised and you prophesied that Israel would be in captivity only for 70 years. Oh Lord, help me understand. When, oh Lord, when, oh Lord, will this reality of ending our, our captivity come? And Jeremiah is praying, and Jeremiah 25 verse 11 says this, The whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now that's Jeremiah who was a contemporary of Daniel. Jeremiah is prophesying. Oh God, 70 years, captivity. Right? Now we jump to Daniel chapters 2. Right? And if you go to verses 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. 
wait a second. Jesus quotes Daniel. Daniel quotes Jeremiah. Can somebody help me? What's going on here? Well, we are quoting Jesus. So it goes from Jeremiah to Daniel to Jesus to us. Wait till we get to Revelations. There is a common theme being shared here that we got to pay attention to. So let's see what that common theme is because Daniel decides this. Daniel says, I prayed, verse 4, well, let's, let's continue on, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Not the abomination that causes desolation, but the desolation, the annihilation, the captivity of, of, of Israel with Babylon. He's saying, Jeremiah, the prophet, prophesied that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him and prayed and petitioned and fasting in sackcloth and ashes. I pray to the Lord my God and I confessed, O Lord, the great awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned. Love that idea. We have sinned and done wrong. Daniel is a, is a pro prophet praying every day and yet he's saying we have sinned. Isn't that beautiful? Look, all of you sinners here, right? I'm the pastor, right? And all you good-for-nothing people out there, I'm the holy one standing on this altar. Isn't that right? You all came to me because you're all sinners. That's what we try to portray in this modern context of this bless me ministry, this God standing on the altar. When Daniel proves, I have sinned, just with you and I, we have all sinned and come short of God's glory. Amen? And if, if I don't recognize the equality I have as a human being that needs to be saved by grace, we have missed the mark. And don't you dare look at prophets and preachers and pastors and televangelists as if they are gods. Huh. My time is running out. I have to jump all the way. Let's jump all the way to verse 20. And we'll pick it up again because I want to finish off in five minutes. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, verse 20, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy city, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the angel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. Remember insight, foresight, and oversight? Remember that theme of message that we got a few years, a couple of years ago, right? He's getting insight, right, into the foresight of God's oversight. Did you get that? The angel came to give Daniel insight, right, to the foresight of God's oversight, of his prophetic creative plan for redemption ultimately from the already and the not yet. Of course, it's heavy. That's why I'm trying to break it down. But it's hard to break this stuff down in one, in one session. It's going to take weeks to break it down. Just that alone is a message by itself. When the angel gives Daniel a prophetic understanding of this vision of what is to come, Daniel has no clue. There was no cars in Daniel's day. The best he could say is maybe he knows a donkey and a lamb. Right? His mode of transportation, perhaps. He has no clue what a helicopter is or a plane. And yet, 2022, we can identify with the revelation story of what God unfolds in what was to come way ahead of his time. And all he was told was to do, right. I, I got to bring it home. Let, let me finish off this verse for you. Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As, you, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. What's he praying for? God, how long? When are we going to come out of captivity? You promised Jeremiah 70 years, Lord. Let's read on what he says now. Let's read what it means. Because he's praying specifically about the 70 weeks. God, I think it's over. What's up, God? You said 70 weeks, God. It's over, according to Jeremiah. It's over, Lord. What's up? We're still in Babylon. Hello? So he's praying and he's saying, we have sinned. And why have we sinned? Because you are holding back from the revelation because we keep sinning, oh God, forgive us and redeem us and rescue us from captivity. And Daniel reads on. 
because the angel is giving him words now. He says this. He says, therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Verses 24. Go to the next slide for me. Seventy sevens are decreed. Keep going until you get to the, to the finish. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. Whose people? Daniel's people. Not Africans. Not Canadians. Not North Americans. For the people that God had chosen at that specific time where the seed or the Messiah would come from. That people he's talking about right now. Okay? He says 70 weeks is what? A decree for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Who is he talking about? Who will end sin? Who will bring righteousness? Who will anoint as the most holy one? He's talking about the Messiah. Israel, the vision of 70 weeks will end with the Messiah coming to bring restoration against sin and evil and bring righteousness to my people, right? And to anoint him as the Holy One. I'm going to end there because if I don't end there, we're going to go too late. Check this out. The Orthodox Church is just celebrating Easter this weekend. The Jews were celebrating Passover from Palm Sunday for a full eight days. But do they have they anointed the most holy one? Because when Daniel prophesied this for his people, they are still looking for the most holy one. And God declared in that verse that after the 70 weeks, the most holy one is going to make you righteous and you're going to have to anoint him as the most holy one. Hasn't, that hasn't happened yet. But somebody say, praise God. praise God. Last Sunday, we reflected, and you and I know who the most holy one is. Yeshua HaMashiach. He's the savior of the world. His name is Jesus. And I want to just finish the verse off before I confuse you too much more. All right? This, that slide, I'm going to break it down for you next week. But you will see there is 70 weeks in there. There's seven, there is 62, and there is one. So far, so good? If you add them all together, what do you get? You get 70, right? So we're doing good so far, right? The only challenge is there is a pending in there. The pending to the end. There is a pending in there that you will see that everybody is still confused about and the great prophets of the past who I told you, for example, that Martin Luther in the Protestant movement in the 16th century was prophesying this pending moment was going to end around 150 years after the 16th century. The great lit planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, Orson Welles, you name them. And they're still prophesying when the pending end will come. I'll help you with that next week and the following weeks to come. Okay, maybe not next week because it's communion, but I'm going to walk you through this journey right now. Because there is so much more to come in this story right here. Because the pending is where he's talking about. Because of 70 years, Israel doesn't understand it. So they themselves are in a pending moment. Different from you and I. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Verses 25. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. I'm not going to confuse you. Online, you're confused. 70 sevens, seven sevens and 62 sevens. What does he say? Until the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? The Messiah, Jesus. So until he shows up, it's going to be what? It's going to be 69 weeks. Or 69 weeks of years. I'll break it down for you next week. And that's where that cross in the middle there shows you. Seven sevens and 62 sevens. Jesus shows up. Exactly. Exactly where the time was to be. He showed up 483 years later from when the decree was made by God to Jeremiah. Isn't that amazing? From Jeremiah's prophetic word to
to when Jesus shows up in, in, in 0 AD. It was 483 years. One week equals a year. So guess what? There's a missing seven. We'll talk about it, and then we're going to continue on this path to help you understand, because that missing seven is what I'm talking about. It's the pending of the ending. And boy, are we ever close in 2022. Boy, are we ever close. And I'm telling you, we are so close. Let me finish off the verse, and we're going to end right there. It will be the, to rebuild the streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off. Good Friday. Cut off. Right? And we'll have nothing. Of course. He dies. He's buried. He's, but then does what? He's resurrected. And then he does what? He is and he is ascended, right? Let's read on. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will come until the end and desolations have been decreed. Desolations, now referring to the abomination of desolations. It says right here, it says, he will confirm a covenant. Who's he? The one who will perform the desolation, the Antichrist. All right, stay with me. You'll get more later on. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Woo! Uh, sorry if, if you aren't theologians here. But that old good slew foot for nothing, s Satan, who was back in the garden, who was in Matthew 24, is going to show up again to deceive you and I. And it's going to be the last seven or the last seven years. The last week of the 70 weeks. It's pending. It's pending. My wife just said amen. That's a good introduction. Go to the next slide quickly. And there's the amen. Go to the next slide. The prophet, the prophet Daniel's vision, pending, boom. And then in that pending moment, somewhere, the tribulation or that last seven has to start. It's pending from the 69th week to the 70th week. And whenever that pending starts, the start of tribulation Daniel says, if you read on, I, I got to read it, Rosa. Sorry, my head. I got to read it. Let's read on here. It says, verses uh, 27. Are you, are you following me? Verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And look what it says. In the middle of the seven. In the middle of the seven. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Abomination that causes desolation. Wow. Wow. Let me read it. And a wing, and on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is his creed is poured out onto him. If I jump to chapter 12, you would see three and a half years is 1290 days. I won't say too much more because we've got to write a book on this one because there ain't too many leaders telling the truth. They want to tell you when is the tribulation? When is, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? And nobody has seen the truth of this thing here. If Jesus echoes abomination, desolation, if Daniel echoes it, wait till you see what Revelation says. <laughs> wait till you see what Revelation says. And, if, and all I'm going to say to you is this. Pastor Gibbs, ask me. Pastor Gibbs, when is the start of the tribulation? I don't know. But say, Pastor Gibbs, when is the beginning of the great tribulation? I can answer that one. When the Antichrist is revealed. You can start counting. I'll leave you hanging with that one. I will pick up on it next week. I'll leave you hanging. When the Antichrist is revealed, you can start counting three and a half years. I'll leave you hanging with that one. Read Daniel chapters 9 all the way to chapters 12. We're going to talk about the seal. Revelation talks about the seal. Daniel talks about the seal. God told Daniel to seal up the prophecy. And then Revelation says, break the seal. 
Oh, let me stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get too excited. Father, we bless your word today. Open the eyes of us and the understanding in our minds. This is so much confusion, Lord, but I pray the simplicity of your gospel will go forth. To understand that prophetic word of the times we are living in. You declared it in the, in the gospels, and yet you use the prophetic word through Jeremiah and through Daniel to teach us the oracles and the truth of when this time shall be in this pending moment, the already and the not yet. And even so, Maranatha, you are coming, Lord, and so would you come, Lord Jesus. This is our prayer that you give us, you told us to read so we can understand. And I pray for understanding in the name of Jesus. Go to the last slide for me. The next one. There he is. You can rest everything you live on, on that statement. All right? We just reflected and celebrated the resurrection. When he was resurrected, the angels, and I'm telling you right now, Jesus says, I'll be back. Amen.